Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a passage that there's a lot of controversy over now among some grace believers about what verse 19, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, uh, means, the reconciling of the world there in chapter 5, verse 19. We're going to begin reading this morning in verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And yes, there is believers that Paul is writing to in the chapter, in the context. He's talking to believers who are new creatures in Christ. He says, all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's the sharing of the gospel so that others might be reconciled to God by trusting Christ died for their sins. Verse 19, to wit, which means to know, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Hold your place here and turn to Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. This is the other time in the New Testament and in your Bible that the term reconciling of the world appears, and it's the explanation of what he means in 2 Corinthians 5.19, because Paul's talking about the same thing. And here in verse 15 of Romans 11, for if the casting away of them that's Israel in the context, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So the casting away of them is the, is the casting away of the nation of Israel so that God was able to reckon Israel, instead of in that position of status before God as God's privileged nation that he had made covenants with in time past, uh, the Abrahamic covenant that he would bless all nations through the rise of Israel as God's priestly nation, that he would bless them that blessed Israel and curse the nations that cursed Israel. Instead of being in that position of status before God, when God cast Israel away through the fall of them, which is what this passage is talking about in Romans 11 verse 15, uh, that happened uh, in the book of Acts after the stoning of Stephen, and before God raised up the Apostle Paul, we'll say it in chapter 7, God cast away the nation of Israel after the stoning of Stephen. When Christ is standing at the Father's right hand, ready to bring the wrath and judgment here, he comes down instead to reveal to the Apostle Paul in, in, in um, Acts chapter 9, he's Saul of Tarsus, he appears to him on the road to Damascus, Saul gets saved, he's the first member of the body of Christ, and God begins to real, reveal to Saul that he has appointed him as the apostle of the Gentiles to provide salvation to all men. He says to Gentiles, to the children, of, or to kings, and to the children of Israel. So all men are, are included when the Lord appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, and he gets saved, and he begins to reveal to Paul what the purpose is for raising him up as the apostle of the Gentiles, because salvation today is now available to all men. So it's by the, rec by the fall of Israel that God reckons Israel among the rest of the nations, that salvation now, through the message, the gospel God gave through the Apostle Paul, that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel message that Paul preached as soon as God began to reveal to him that he was sending him as the apostle to all men. Paul was the first to believe that gospel, that Christ died for his sins uh, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day. Paul believed at first, was the first member of the body of Christ, and preached that which by which he was saved to the rest of uh, the world. Israel's now reckoned among the Gentiles. Israel's no longer that channel of blessing, that nation of priests, by which salvation goes to the, to the world today in this dispensation of grace. So if that's what the reconciling of the world means in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
in verse 19. Then who is the first, the, the, the idea that some grace believers are using for this passage is instead of the fall of Israel being the way God reconciled the world to himself and then the, the be you reconciled to all men, the word of reconciliation that we're entrusted with being the, the gospel to call men individually in, in the whole world reckon, uh, to be sinful and um, able to receive salvation by trusting the gospel today, the message they have to believe, the gospel, the grace of God, is preached by individual believers. And if they trust that Christ died for their sins, they're added to the church today that God is forming in the dispensation of grace, the, the church, the body of Christ. So who is the first to preach that at the cross, Christ died to pay for all men's sins, not just the sins of the nation of Israel? Now, Paul's the first one that was given, was commanded to take the gospel to all men. So the reconciling of the world, making it possible for the gospel message to go to all men, was the fall of Israel. This began to be preached by the Apostle Paul, if you read the book of Acts, to all men. If you read the, the, the letters that Paul wrote during the first part of his ministry, uh, the letters that he wrote uh, to the Galatians, the Thessalonians, to the Romans, the Corinthians. He wrote those uh, epistles from Acts chapter 16 through Acts chapter 21. If you read those epistles that Paul wrote, he'll give an account who he ministered to. He ministered to all men. Just as God had sent him and told him he was sending him to all men, that's what Paul did. Um, we're going to look at a few verses this morning. That's not what the kingdom program, the scope of the kingdom program, wasn't to all men uh, during the, uh, the revelation, like, uh, for example, turn with me if you would, um, to, um, well, go first with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We're going to look at a couple verses where Paul's ministry, he wrote the book of Romans, go to chapter 3, verse 22 in Romans, here Paul wrote the book of Romans by inspiration of God in, in Acts chapter 20. Uh, if you read in verse 22 or verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even, notice, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The gospel that God gave to the Apostle Paul, that Paul was preaching throughout the book of Acts after he was converted, is that Christ died for all. And he says in this verse that the faith of Jesus Christ, his, the faith of Jesus Christ is him being faithful as he promised to the Father uh, to go to the cross, to die for the sins of all men before the foundation world. Christ fulfilled that in, the, in being made the sacrificial death for all men, which was the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that ratified the new covenant God promised to the nation of Israel. That blood to atone the sins of his people is rolled out, that salvation, that atonement, that redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross through Paul's ministry is rolled out to the whole world. Paul preaches that it's available to all here in this verse that we read, verse 22, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that what? That believe. So no one is automatically forgiven at the cross, as some teach Romans, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 to say, that, that the reconciling of the world, not imputing the trespasses unto them, was God forgiving all men's sins at the cross. But your sins aren't forgiven at the cross, but that's, the Apostle Paul was the one who, was given the message to preach that Christ died for all, being uh, that he died for all and paid for all men's sins at the cross isn't the same as saying all men's sins are forgiven at the cross. God hasn't forgiven everybody's sins by dying to pay for everyone's sins, but he makes salvation available as a free gift to all who will believe and receive the forgiveness that's only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that was what he preached. Now, if you go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, another passage, we're going to see in a minute that that was not the message that the 12 were sent to preach, that Christ died for all. Um, 
they weren't even offering the kingdom uh, gospel to all men. Uh, the twelve did not preach the cross as good news. And even after the cross, in the book of Acts, the twelve only preached the resurrection of Christ, but not the, the content of the gospel. The gospel that the Christ died, was buried, and rose again was not what the twelve preached after the cross for salvation. Uh, we know that they continued to preach that they uh, that they that Israel needed to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and that God raised Him from the dead. That was the message that they preached. Uh, but in First uh, Timothy chapter two, verse six, um, we're going to start reading in verse three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, or God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The twelve were not sent to testify that Christ died to pay for all men's sins. That wasn't, if you read through the book of Acts and the message preached to Cornelius and the and the message to the Ethiopian eunuch, they were not preaching to those, Peter didn't preach and, and uh, Philip didn't preach that Christ died to pay for the sins of all men. That wasn't the message given to them. It was That message was given to Paul to preach for the first time that when Christ died to pay for Israel's sins, he died for the sins of the world. And that we're gonna, we're gonna continue. We see that here. He gave himself a ransom for all. That was, you're only going to find that in the in Paul's epistles, that reference. Uh, go with me now to chapter 4. It was testified in due time. It happened at the cross, but it wasn't testified until the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he says here, it was testified in due time in verse 6 and verse 7, where until I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. That was Paul's message to reveal to the world that Christ died for the sins of all men. Now, look at um, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy and verse 10. Another way of saying it here, uh, verse 10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, known especially of those that believe, so the only way anybody, all men, are going to benefit from Christ dying to pay for the sins of all, gave himself a ransom for all, is that they trust in him that he died for their sins, their individual personal sins. That's why the gospel message is Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. The trusting that Christ died for your sins is how God the Holy Spirit sees your faith in the gospel Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Once God places you in Christ, your sins are paid for. For he hath, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So it's in Christ that we're made the righteousness of God. It's in Christ that that when he died, we, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he rose, we were raised with him. You have to be in Christ for the benefits of the cross or what was accomplished there for the payment that was made there to be applied to you. And that only happens when you trust the gospel, that God places you in Christ and, and the application of what Christ did on the cross is applied to that believer. And that's the way it's always been in the word of God. And throughout the scriptures, only believers are considered to be what the scriptures call a believer is one of the elect, one of the called. And apart from Calvinism, which, which teaches that the elect in the Bible are those that God foreordained or predestined to be saved, that's, that's false, that's not true. The only method of election the Bible te teaches or talks about is that believer using their free will to choose to elect to believe instead of rejecting God in faith.
So election is the, is the method that God chose to call all to salvation through faith in Him, trusting in Him. And uh, we can see that. Go to 2 Thessalonians. In chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, what? Chosen you to salvation. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved. That's not Calvinism. That's not God predestinating you to be saved. He chose you to be saved. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit, or and belief of the truth. That's a method whereby sanctification of the Spirit is God's Word calling you, God using His spiritual Word to call you with the Gospel message, and your response, belief in that truth, in that message. That's how God chose you to salvation from the beginning, before He created Adam and Eve with a free will and knew that they would use it to choose sin and knew that he would have to send Christ to the cross to redeem all men from their sins, he ordained that all would be called or chosen in his Son, and that those who trusted in God for salvation through the ages would be made righteous in Christ and through Christ. Look at verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. All salvation is through the cross for all men in every age. Christ, the blood of Christ was applied to those who died in faith in time past. It's not that they understood they needed to trust Christ would die for their sins. They didn't understand that at all. They weren't given that revelation. They were trusting in God to send a Redeemer and a Savior to take care of them in time past and trusted in God for His mercy. So that's how... God saves people, he calls them by the gospel. That's, been, that's the process of election or the process of calling men unto salvation by different messages throughout the Bible. But Paul is given to explain how God justifies men in Romans through Philemon. So if you look, uh, turn with me now to uh, Matthew chapter 10. So Paul was the one that preached, was given the gospel that Christ is the Savior of all men. Now, if we look at Matthew chapter 10, the, the Lord chose his 12 disciples and he trained them during his earthly ministry, the three years that he uh, functioned as Israel's, uh, that he presented himself to Israel through the baptism of John uh, until the cross was about a three year period. And in chapter 10, verse 1, and when he had called unto him, unto himself, his twelve disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand and so forth. So Christ sent the twelve, his twelve disciples, his twelve apostles, were sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The kingdom gospel was not preached by the twelve to the Gentiles. Turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to who? To none but the Jews only. So the twelve and their ministry through the book of Acts, until Acts chapter 11 we see here, they were not preaching that the kingdom saints take the gospel to the whole world. That message that Christ died for the sins of all men was only revealed through the Apostle Paul. Now, if you look back at the prophetic scriptures, you'll see that God purposed through the Abrahamic covenant to offer salvation to the whole world. But Israel had first, it was God's appointment, they had to first get the nation of Israel to a condition where they would function as that righteous nation of priests 
and able to use Israel as his channel of blessing to send salvation to the rest of the world. That will take place at his second coming. Israel under the new covenant will be made righteous in Christ. They'll, they'll love the Lord with all their heart, mind, and soul. God will put the law in their hearts and through his power, they'll be that nation of priests. They'll be in resurrection bodies at that time. They will not have a sin nature. God will be able to use them as his instrumental uh, channel of blessing to offer salvation to the whole world. But not yet. That purpose hadn't been fulfilled. The first fruits of the, of the uh, and in Acts chapter 2, the first fruits of the new covenant, you see that the tongues and so forth are the first fruits of what God would be able to accomplish with Israel fully functioning under the new covenant out in the millennial reign of Christ. And, and throughout eternity. So we're going to, I want you to um, turn to Isaiah 53 with me. Isaiah 53. So in time past, God revealed that Christ would go to the cross in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 53. But this prophecy doesn't say that he's going to go to the cross to die for all men, does it? Um, look at uh, verse 5. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. So, glory to God, we can claim that as, as members of the body of Christ. That verse is what God wrote through the prophets for us. And you can't claim that to be yourselves because if you consider who Isaiah is, is the is the prophet that he's ministering to it's for his people uh, as you look down in the passage verse 6 he will make it clear he's not saying that Christ died for our all men's transgressions you'll see that he was bruised for Israel's transgressions for Israel's iniquities and that's all that was revealed by Isaiah or through Isaiah by God through him uh, look at verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, pay attention as we look at verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. I say it as a prophet sent to Israel. It's Israel is his people. That's who God had revealed Christ would die for, Israel. God had made covenants with Israel. The Apostle Paul uh, makes that clear. Uh, but before we go uh, to that passage, let's look at verse 11 of Isaiah 53. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. See the many there? It, the, he shall justify many. That doesn't say he's going to justify all. That doesn't say that uh, his uh, that the travail of his soul is going to be for all men. It's saying that it's going to be available for many in Israel. For he shall bear their iniquities. Yeah, look at verse 12. It says the same thing in verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So as far as the prophecy about Christ coming and dying on the cross in Isaiah 53, it's for many that's been revealed through that passage he would die for Israel's sins. Now go to Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, the Lord is, it's the night before he goes to the cross. In verse 28. Matthew 26, 28. For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Lord tells them when he, he knows he's going to the cross and he's going to shed his blood as promised, as Israel's Redeemer. Um, he's going to shed his blood, as Isaiah 53 was talking about. And he says here, he repeats that many phrase and not for all here in Isaiah I mean, sorry, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Uh, if you look at Mark 14, 
in verse Mark 14, verse 23, it's uh, the, the wording is slightly different, but it's at the same time. Uh, and he took the cup, verse 23, Mark 14, 23, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it, and he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So the fact that Christ shed his blood at the cross for all men wasn't revealed until it was revealed through the Apostle Paul. Now, just for a comparison, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. This is when Paul says that he received of the Lord, just like he used the term, I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, Christ died for our sins. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 24, um, he says, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he bet uh, was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do, this do, as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, do you notice a difference in which he said that in the way we read it in Matthew and Mark? In Matthew and Mark, he says, this is the testimony of my blood, or testament of my blood, which is shed for many. The new covenant of my blood, which is shed for many. Here, the for many is not, is omitted. When Christ told the Apostle Paul to observe this with the rest of the body of Christ, there's no restriction who he shed the blood for. And that's because it's through his ministry God gave more revelation that what he accomplished on the cross wasn't just for Israel, his people's sins, but it was for the sins of all men. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. This is explained to Israel about what was accomplished. The, the accomplishments of the cross is, is explained to Israel in Hebrews through, uh, through revelation as God revealed to the church the body of Christ in Romans through Philemon. So in Hebrews, they get some light about the New Testament and what was accomplished, the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, we looked at a little while ago, at who the called are. Those are believers in Israel. The sins of the, of the Old Testament were paid for by the shed blood of Christ to ratify the New Covenant with Israel. Israel saved from the sins of the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament was given as a standard of righteousness whereby God set the bar. If you meet this standard, you'll have eternal life. But if you don't, I'm going to send my son. And if you trust in me, I'm going to take care of your sin problem, and you'll inherit the land forever that God promised through Abraham that involved uh, resurrection life for Israel to inherit that as it was for Abraham. Um, so, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. The reconciling of the world is simply God setting the nations of Israel's program aside so that the wrath, not imputing their trespasses, that was promised upon Israel and the other nations to fall with the, uh, in the tribulation period during the day of the Lord, that's been held in abeyance or, or interrupted in order for God to offer long-suffering and salvation to all. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we could look into your word. We thank you for uh, the clarity and the understanding that we gain from comparing the scriptures to settle in, in our minds what you'd have us to trust in and believe today in this dispensation of grace and how we should walk before you. And we thank you for the clarity and light we have and your word. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.